Thank you very much indeed for uh, inviting me onto this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm John Lamont, I'm Chief Executive of Transport Greater Manchester, uh, and I'm also the Chair of the Urban Transport Group, the uh, UK's largest cities, much like Daniel Bergeron is for uh, Canada. So I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, connection between health and uh, transport in UK. Uh, and what we're doing about it. So first of all what I'll do is just talk a little bit about uh, Greater Manchester, who we are, because uh, the audience probably don't know who we are, uh, a little bit about our, our strategy, uh, where we're going in devolution, how it relates to health, uh, just a little bit about how we can figure that into our 2040 strategy and then talk about how we're trying to deal with some of the health challenges and use transport interventions to help that. Uh, before I try and bring it together. So a little bit about uh, Greater Manchester. Uh, we are the heart of the north of England. Uh, we are about 2.7 million people. Uh, and the big thing about us is that we have a strong political consensus uh, and organisational consensus through the 10 authorities who make up Greater Manchester, who've been working together for some years and formed a combined authority back in 2011. So that makes it a lot easier for us to actually implement some of the things that we're trying to do. If you don't know us from uh, where we are in UK, you probably know us for things like uh, Manchester United uh, and Manchester City Football Clubs uh, and for Coronation Street for anyone that watches that. big part about us, of course, is that we actually uh, exceed in economic terms the potential of many of the other areas in UK and that's both a blessing and also a challenge for us in some of the health challenges it gives us. As Greater Manchester, we have a strategy. Uh, it's a growth and reform agenda. It's very much around, by 2020, Manchester having pioneered a new model for sustainable economic growth based around a more connected, talented and greener city region where all of our residents are able to contribute to and benefit from sustained prosperity and enjoy quality of life. And you'll see that there's a statement there that really does directly relate health and transport choices. And that's the basis for this presentation and where we're going to go. But actually, we can't achieve that as a region unless we have more devolution from central government. And that's what I'm coming to next. Back in November 14, we signed an agreement between government, uh, the Treasury, and Greater Manchester leaders, uh, which was absolutely innovative and a game changer for us. What it does is it gives us some powers and greater authority to shape the economy and society and deal with environmental challenges in a much more joined up way. It's not just about handing over money, it's more about getting better outcomes if we join the various strands together. So planning, health, education, transport, putting those together. So in May 17, we'll have uh, a, an elected mayor. We've got an interim mayor right now, and he has the overall responsibility for drawing this together. So what does it mean? Um, we have some new powers, particularly over housing, and where new housing is going to go, what we do about it, uh, putting funding towards developing that around skills and business support, and particularly around health and social care come back to that in a moment. Transport is the key enabler to make all of these things happen. Health and social care though is critical because what we've got is a national health service, local councils, hospitals, clinical uh, care groups actually working together for some time. It's a six billion pound a year program and that sounds enormous until you realize that we're about a billion pounds short of where we need to be on health. So absolutely sorting health and transport is important. We have some of the worst health in uh, the country. So what we've got to focus on is preventing ill health and promoting healthy lifestyles so that we can close the gap between the worst off and those with best health, the worst in the region, the best of the UK. So we need to join all these things together and that's what our devolution is about. How do we do that in transport? Well, we've brought together for the first time a 2040 vision, done it with our partners in business, 
we've done it with the local authorities and health partners. And I guess it's hard to think what you might be doing in 2040. What is the world going to look like in 25 years' time? But it's really important for transport when schemes take so long to deliver that we start thinking about what that world looks like, that we've got a resilient infrastructure that supports the economy of the time and is giving that better environment and a better quality of life for everyone. So this vision is all about putting the customer at the heart of what we do. And we've tried to look at it in the sense of the that stronger together vision for the economy and how we can put transport in the middle of that. So our vision for transport is world-class connections supporting long-term sustainable economic growth and access to opportunity for all. But what does that really mean? Well, these strands from the Greater Manchester strategy, we need to work out how they, they relate. So sustainable economic growth, what does that really mean? Well, we're going to try and reduce congestion, uh, improve access and improve reliability. In terms of the environment, we want to get more people on public transport, on foot, on bikes, we want to reduce emissions. So in terms of quality of life, we want to provide better access to essential services, we want to improve safety, reduce crime, and help people make healthier travel choices. And we want to get that spirit of innovation, so that means integrated payment systems, smart ticketing, real-time information, better data, encouraging low emission vehicles so that people are more encouraged to use more sustainable means of transport. And what we have done in the past is we have uh, looked at what each mode does, but we've done something different here and we've tried to look at spatial themes around what we're doing. In this, health figures quite a lot because yes, global connectivity is part of it, city to city links with other regions throughout the UK are important. But if we think about uh, travel in and around the regional centre and district centres, that's all about social inclusion and how we can join people together. People want to be together. We don't want them, elderly people, sitting in houses by themselves. Transport across the wider city region. So as we deal with the challenges to healthcare and have perhaps less hospitals, uh, less GPs, people need to travel to get to them. So how do we provide access to them? How do we encourage them to use better public transport? And then the connected neighbourhoods, which are really important, those towns and villages out there uh, that we need to connect. And that's a role where active travel can play a real part, cycling and walking, to make that more part of people's daily lives. So in doing this, we've looked at a wide range of factors uh, that are going to influence how we deal with things in the future. We are seeing, like a lot of places around the globe, um, a more globalised uh, northern powerhouse economy across the whole north of England, a requirement for an increasingly skilled workforce. We've got a lot of good things to say about uh, transport innovation. We've got advanced manufacturing here. We've got digital. We've got creative industries. How do we harness those? In the society, we've got a more economically active population. They're out there. They want to do things. Their needs are diverse. How do we deal with that? Urban development, we see uh, in this economic growth unprecedented demand for housing. We're seeing a need for another 200,000 houses. We're seeing densification in cities. We need to accommodate that. We're going to have a problem with uh, low emissions. Uh, we need to achieve low emissions. We've got to be su sustainable uh, and resilient to the effects of climate change. And then we've got issues around policy. How do we deal with a more devolved administration? How do we deal with integrated public service delivery for health and transport? And these are the challenges that we face. So let's look at some of the challenges that we've got in health across Greater Manchester. And we have some huge ones. The lack of physical activity out there causes lots of uh, heart disease problems. Tameside is particularly uh, an issue for us in one of our districts. Diabetes is on the rise, and there are lots of deaths per year as a result from inactivity. We see lots of uh, increases in heart disease levels and lots of things that we see as classes as obesity. And that's a real challenge, particularly in the young. Uh, and for the first time, we're talking about uh, children of the generation now who might experience less life expectancy than their parents. 
uh, and that's a tragic consequence that we just can't afford to happen. Air pollution is quite crucial. 6% uh, of deaths quite uh, are attributed to air pollution at the moment. Uh, and it's a picture that we have to change, uh, and we will. So how can transport help? Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing in air quality, the management area that we put around it, how we can change behaviours, because that's absolutely crucial, how we improve the transport fleet to a more sustainable uh, approach. And let's talk about those uh, as we go. We have to, as part of all this, work far more closely with the health sector than we ever have done. We have to integrate it. We have a thing called total transport here where we talk about joining together transport, health services, education as one and using the resources to better effect. Those are working with public health and we need to work out how we best put investments in and support each other's interventions. And then we need to prepare for an aging population. Uh, increasingly, we have issues around an aging population here. How do we make sure they don't experience that bit of being locked away at home, don't get out, because that will um, not help them in health, uh, health wise. We have lots of issues in mental well-being, um, particularly among uh, young people, particularly around uh, middle-aged people. We need to address some of those issues, and they're linked to things like worklessness, um, to and we need to address those and we need to make sure that people who've grown up with various modes of transport realize the benefits of walking so uh, for the elderly walking has to be part of their daily lives and we want to make sure that's the case let me come back to air quality because air quality is actually a new problem it was this is the front cover of a book from the 1920s that shows that air quality has always been an issue uh, this is an area uh, that's built around cotton mills uh, and um, smoking chimneys, it's always been a problem. Right now, NOx is still a problem. There are still areas that are exceeding European limits. We're meeting our particulates targets, but they're still a concern because of the health impacts they have. Life expectancy, as I've said, is below the UK average. Air quality is still an issue for us. So our way of addressing that is by looking at an air quality management area uh, and this is based on NOx. What you're looking at is the green areas that are part of that air quality management area. And you'll see that the biggest problem areas are the regional centre and also the motorway network. In other words, transport is the problem. It's contributing to the road transport, 75% of the NOx problem and 81% of the PM10 particulates problem. So we have to do something about it from a transport perspective. And like many other areas uh, that are across the world, NOx has not decreased entirely as expected, partly because uh, the standards for engines, Euro standards, have not delivered. There are more diesel cars on the road, because at one time we thought that was the answer. So we have to do more. What we're dealing with is some local measures that uh, try and address the background reduction. But actually, some of these have been quite difficult to actually target, difficult to measure and there's a limit to what you can do locally. So we need to think more widely than that. What we've done is, is look at who can do these things, what more can we do, how much can we do locally. Now we've produced a local emission strategy which has just gone out for consultation as part of our strategy refresh to try and tackle carbon at the same time because these are part of the problems. And what we've identified is it's the vehicles themselves are the problem. We need to have low or zero emission vehicles, particularly in the city centres. Uh, we need to have them there because if that's where the people are concentrated, that's where the problem is. So local authorities can't do that by themselves. We need to have a partnership between the manufacturers and the operators, and we need government support to make that happen, and that's what we're trying to do. We're doing an awful lot on travel choices, and I'm going to talk a little bit about public transport and how we uh, optimize that, active travel, by which, I, by, by which I mean cycling, walking, and projecting our vision of what we want to do. So what we do is an awful lot about promoting public trans transport. And the way we've done that is by having personalized tra travel planning, which we've delivered across 27,000 households across Greater Manchester. What they do is they people can complete a survey, they return it to us, 
Then they receive a personalised travel pack that gives them a journey plan, a free taster for the ticket journey that they might currently make by car, and how they do it on public transport. For those that want to cycle, we give them a cycle journey plan and information on free training on cycling uh, and free tr uh, training on maintenance as well, as well as a local cycle map. We do the same with businesses. Um, we work with lots of businesses and organisations to try and encourage sustainable and active commuting with their employees. We try and focus on what are the real benefits for business. Businesses tend to focus on a bottom line, so we try and explain to them what the financial savings are in terms of staff productivity from having a more sustainable and active commuting. People who are doing that are generally healthier, they'll come to work more, they'll contribute more, their productivity is higher, and we can make the case with some hard-nosed finance directors in business. We're strong on, on vision here for cycling. We've got a target of making 10% of all journeys by bike for 2025. We want to make it a mainstream activity like you see in Holland, uh, where it's an everyday part of life and people expect to do it. If we can do that, then it's part of our plan for making uh, a city region that's fit for the future, where people want to live, where they want to visit. So that's our aim, and we're doing all the things on the right-hand side of the slide to make that happen. We know that 75% of people here would like to see more investment in cycling. So that's what we're delivering. It's not without its challenges, though, because only 23% of people here ride their bike more than once a month. We know that cycling is growing into the city. Uh, we've seen 200% rise since 2005 and 4% in the last year. But we know that 27% of people would love to cycle, but they don't own a bike. And safety is a real concern. Only 26% of people regard safety on the road as good or very good. So we've got some challenges. How do we react to that? Well, we're putting in a lot of cycle infrastructure. We've got an extensive program of cycle routes, including off-road, segregated on-road, and indeed things that we do on-road. The point is, one solution will not solve everything. We will do particular schemes depending on the particular location. We're putting in cycle traffic signals and secure cycle parking at key sites. This is going along with that behavior change. You won't do it just by putting in infrastructure. So we're looking at cycle training at all levels. So the public will go into schools. What we're finding is that actually some of our cycle classes now are adopted by adults who are seeing their kids taking up cycling in schools and say, yeah, actually, we could do that. Then we could do that as a family. So we'll do lots of promotional activity, promotional marketing, and events across the piece to make cycling more of a core thing. Um, what we're doing is not just putting in cycle hubs with secure locations, but we'll put in showers, we'll put in changing facilities, because you don't want to come off your cycle and then go into work all hot and sweaty, so you give people the chance to do that in a much better way where it's a full offer. How does this all link to health? Well, we've got one plan for dealing with this, which is greater match to moving and a blueprint for physical activity and sport. These are all linked. It's a collective response from everyone to inactivity, and it's how we can work with public health, sport, and we have some very, very strong uh, sporting arenas here, including a velodrome, home of British cycling, and we try and join that with planning and economic growth so that we have one view of it for everyone from the earliest of years right through to the elderly. And if we do that and work together, we can actually make this place a healthier place to live 